All right. Uh, well, good evening to you all. I um, hope you're all having a great week. Uh, I'd just like to thank publicly those who are um, helped support this program, this channel. As everybody knows, everything here is for free. I don't charge for knowledge. Um, sharing the wisdom of the great Kabbalists. And, uh, but I do appreciate it when people um, chip in. Um, Kabbalah Decoded at buymeacoffee.com slash Kabbalah Decoded. Kabbalah spelled with an H, Kabbalah Decoded. So I do appreciate it. Thank you very much, everybody. And let's get right to it. To it tonight, we have a very, very interesting, um, very interesting class about this week's Torah reading. This week's parsha is called Toldot, Toldos, which is about the birth and uh, the youth of Isaac and Esau. I'm oh, sorry, uh, Jacob and Esau. Um, Jacob and Esau. Esau was actually the older brother. They were twins, but Esau came out first and um, illicitly, apparently, according to the according to the sages, um, you could compare it to a like a test tube. Uh, you put two little stones in. One, the the stone you put in first comes out last. So they use that to compare to say that uh, actually he was. Um, he was impregnated from uh, one ovum, is that how you say it? One, uh, uh, I, I, Jacob was was, um, was from the first uh, ovum and Esau was from the second. Is that the right word? I think it is. Anyway, um, because they were, they were obviously not. Sometimes it happens that with twins, there's actually a split in the uh, in the ovum, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, if anyone wants to correct me on that, you can. But I believe that that's the procedure. Um, sometimes there's a split, and sometimes there is the two different eggs that are um, that are fertilized, and that's what happened in this particular case. That's why they didn't look alike at all. Um, because they came from two different. Um, Two different eggs, two different um, ovums. Is that what you say? I think so. Anyway, ovum. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Yal points out she's a nurse. She should know. All right. Ovum. Good. And Wendy knows too. <laughs> Good. Okay. So um, the story, however, that we want to look at is the story of the blessings of um, that Isaac gave what he thought was his oldest son Esau. But actually, it was not Esau, but rather Jacob. What had happened? What was the what was the whole story? So um, Isaac is getting old already. He's blind, and we'll see the significance of that shortly. Uh, Isaac is blind, and he tells his older son to go and catch him some um, um, wild venison and make him some food and bring it to him. Now the purpose of him telling this, uh, and he says that, that I want to do this so that I can, I will give you my blessing. Now the purpose of him doing this is because Esau, Esau, he was not really known for any other um, fulfilling any other godly command other than honoring his father, and honoring his father he did. He definitely did honor his father. And that is why any of the blessings that he got and any of the rewards that he got, uh, he got because of his, the tremendous honor that he showed his father, respect and honor, which is actually one of the mitzvot in the Torah and one of the Ten Commandments. Honor your mother and father, your father and your mother. Um, so, in any event, um, so Isaac tells Esau to go and make him this, um, the, 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 go and catch him some wild venison and then make this food for him. And he goes, off he goes and he does it. Meanwhile, Rebecca Rivka overheard this. I'm just giving the background now. She overheard and she quickly goes to her younger son, who was completely the opposite character from, uh, from Esau. Esau was a wild man of the field, he's called. Um, liked to go out hunting and so on. And Jacob was a man who sat in the tents. He was a scholar, he was studious, he was, um, in the house of prayer, completely different type. 
So she told him, listen, this is the, this is the situation. Your father wants to give a blessing to the older, your older brother. And I want you to go and get that blessing. So um, I will give you, uh, I will make two kid goats for you and take them into your father. And he will think it's wild venison because they taste very similar apparently. apparently. And uh, he'll bless you instead of blessing Esau. Why did she want to do this? Because she knew that Esau was not prepared for the blessing. In other words, the blessing, had he gotten the blessing, it would have been completely wasted. It would have, um, the blessing would have gone to, uh, gone down the twos, basically. Why? Because the blessing has to do with the covenant, the covenant between uh, ultimately God and Jacob. Uh, God and Abraham it started off with the covenant between God and Abraham, then Isaac and then Jacob, and then eventually Moses and the Jewish people on Mount Sinai. But Esau had never been able to keep the covenant. It wasn't his thing. And that wasn't, uh, he wasn't into keeping covenants. Uh, in fact, he broke a number of covenants uh, that he already had, but uh, that he already made. But be that as it may, Rebecca understood that this was not the right thing. Now, why did, uh, why did Isaac decide that he wanted to do Give. He wasn't a fool. Surely he knew who his son was. So I sent out um, um, an essay today that explains that concept. And basically, the basic idea is that he knew who Esau was, but he wanted to give him a blessing in order to lift him up, in order to uh, change him, in order to make him feel a sense of responsibility and a sense of commitment and so on and so forth. Anyway, read the essay, very well uh, done, from Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, who passed away recently. And uh, I'm putting out an essay, uh, hopefully every week for a while, to um, commemorate his, uh, the great works that he did. Okay, so let us now go to share screen. Oh, there's some people that want to get in, it seems. Uh, just one second before we share a screen. Let me see if I can get them in. Participants. Uh, it's not so easy once they're not in the room. Once we start and it's recording, it's not so easy to let them in. Uh, man, I don't know what to do. Um, this whole participant business, uh, locking, locking the room is just ridiculous. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, not much I can do, sorry. Once we're recording, apparently it doesn't allow you to uh, let, anyone, let anyone in. So. Um, let's see here. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, I know there are people waiting to get in. I can't let you in. I don't know. I wouldn't know how. So, okay, we're going to share the screen. The uh, good advice I will give you is get your own time. <laughs> it's the only thing I can tell you. Um, I just don't know how else to, uh, it doesn't give me an option. All right, okay, here we go. This is Genesis where Rebecca Rivka in Hebrew says to her son Jacob Yaakov, um, bring me two um, kid goats and bring it to your father so that he may bless you. Someone has a question. Ah, stop the recording. Uh, you know what, um, now I can't even stop the recording without stopping the share. Uh, this is a mess. Uh, whatever. Pause recording now. Back to share screen and there we go. Thank you for the good advice. That was the way to do it. Okay, perfect. Okay, so anyway, Rebecca, J Rivka is talking to her son, Jacob, uh, Yaakov. And she says, this food that I'm going to make you, bring it to your father, or after she's already made it, bring it to your father so that he may bless you. But Jacob replied, perhaps he will realize that I'm not his oldest son, because there was a big difference in uh, their voices. There was a big difference in uh, their appearance. Esau was very hairy, and Jacob was very smooth-skinned. And even though Isaac was blind, which is, yes, the sages say that the reason that, he, the reason that he became blind was so that he wouldn't realize what was going on. Uh, but any, in any event, he was, uh, he was blind at that point in time. 
and um, he um, he could nevertheless feel, and um, and that's what actually happened when uh, when when Jacob went in. He said, uh, "Come close, I want to feel you." And he felt his arms, and um, since he had goat skins on his arms, Isaac was convinced that it was indeed his son, even though he said the voice is the voice of Jacob, but the uh, the hands are the hands of Esau. Which is meant to obviously on more than one plane, because Esau was in fact a person who used his hands um, much more than his voice. In other words, he was a violent person who used his hands instead of talking over things. He would he would beat, he would hit, he would kill. And in fact, that's what he did. Um, all right. Um, I'm assuming this is loud enough because I was having some problems the other day with someone else, but in any event, okay, so. Um, so Rebecca says to her, but Jacob replied, perhaps he will realize and will bring upon myself a curse instead of a blessing. But his mother said to him, your curse will be upon me, my son. Your curse will be upon me, my son. Now, interestingly enough, the first curse that we find in the Torah is the curse of Adam and Eve. The curse that was were brought upon them were actually 39 in uh, number. No. There were 10 curses brought upon Adam, 10 upon Eve, uh, 10 upon uh, the Nachash, the principle of evil represented by a snake, and 9 upon the earth. The earth was cursed with 9 curses, that's 39 altogether. So these 39 curses, when she said, uh, when he said, uh, uh, maybe he will curse me, she said, I'm willing to take upon myself all of the 39 curses. And when she was saying that, she was actually starting to rectify what Eve had wrought, what Eve had uh, caused. In other words, the eating of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And Rebecca, Rivka, starts to rectify that by saying, the curses will be upon me. And in fact, no curses came upon her, only blessings. Um, the Ariza Rabbi Yitzhak Luria, the famous Kabbalist from the 1500s, um, has a very, very interesting analysis of the two stories, the story early in Genesis and this story. The story, in other words, of the eating of the tree, uh, eating the fruit of the tree of good, of knowledge of good and evil. And this whole incident with uh, Jacob going in to get the blessings instead of Esau. And he compares the two verses, which is what you can see uh, here. Okay, so we're on this verse over here, um, 3.18, Genesis 3.18 to 19. God says, as a result of the sin, Adam is cursed, Adam and Eve are both cursed. And he says to them, Thorns and thistles it will sprout for you. By the sweat of your brow you shall eat bread. Contrast that with the verse that was now said as a blessing to Jacob, that Isaac blesses Jacob. He says, may God give you of the dew of the heavens an abundant grain and wine. Now, if you notice over here, it says, by the sweat of your brow shall you eat bread. By the sweat of your brow is the opposite of that, of that is the dew of heavens. In other words, the dew comes down without any, you don't have to pray for dew. There's no, there's no prayer for dew. Dew happens automatically. Rain you have to pray for, but dew comes automatically. It's the opposite of by the sweat of your brow, you shall eat bread. That's water and this is water. Dew is water. Sweat of your brow is also water. And they're two opposite things. There is thorns and thistles. For Adam, uh, Adam and Eve, and here abundant grain and wine. Jacob is a blessed, blessed with abundant grain and wine. Okay. We get deeper into the issue now. The the verses are not necessarily in order. Uh, I just quoted them here the way the Arizal, the way Rabbi Yitzhak Luria quotes the verses, and he obviously has an intention in why he quoted them this way, but they're not necessarily in order. As you can see, the next verse is 3.6 as opposed to the previous 3.18, but in any event, it doesn't matter. <clears throat> Genesis 3.6, Eve, Chava, 
took of its fruit and ate, and she gave to her husband and he ate. That's talking about the sin of the tree, uh, of the fruit of the tree of knowledge. <coughs> Chava or Eve took of its fruit and ate, and she gave to her husband and he ate. Over here, the opposite happens in Genesis 27, 25, in the story of Toldot. So he served him, Jacob served his father, and he ate, Isaac ate, and he brought him, Jacob brought Isaac wine, and he drank. Neither the mother or the son participated in this, but they brought wine, brought him food and wine, and he ate and he drank. All right, so she gave her husband, and Rivka gave her husband. She was the one that cooked it. It was only that she gave it to her husband through Jacob. Jacob actually brought the food in. Okay, so then what happened with that food? The food of Adam and Eve, of Adam and Chava, brought a curse upon them because they ate of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil when they weren't supposed to. They were supposed to wait and then eat it at a later point in time when they could elevate it. But they didn't wait, and therefore they were not only el not elevated by it, but they were actually dragged down by it. Therefore the food became a curse for them. Whereas this food brought a blessing upon them, <coughs> brought a, bl a blessing upon Jacob and upon his mother, because she had said, your curses will be upon me. If, you, if your father curses you, they'll be upon me. She didn't say anything about the blessings, but it's self-understood that if the curses will be upon her, if he doesn't curse, but he blesses, if Isaac blesses instead, then the blessings will be upon her as well. So this food brought a curse, and the other fruit, the food brought a, brought a blessing. In other words, the food that came to Adam and Eve through wiliness, through deception, by the nachash, by the snake, by the, the, the power of evil, by the Satan, <clears throat> who's represented by the snake in the story of Adam and Eve. That food came about by way of deception. This food was given to Isaac by way of deception as well. But this was a deception for the sake of good. That was a deception for the sake of evil. This deception led to blessing. That deception led to curse. Okay? <clears throat> the result continues. <coughs> He says there that Adam becomes cursed because you listen to the voice of your wife. Right? You listen to the voice of your wife to do the wrong thing. Not because he listened to his wife. <laughs> it's a good thing to listen to your wife. But because he listened to his wife to do the wrong thing. Actually, he made a calculation. The sages say as follows. He was debating whether he should, listen, he should, uh, he should do what his wife was telling him to do, eat of the fruit. But he knew that she would die and then he would be alone um, for the rest of his years. She would die soon afterwards. That's what he calculated. That's what he thought. And in fact, um, oh, now it allows me to admit what you say. Okay. <clears throat> and, um, and in the opposite case, in the case of, of Rivka, of Rebecca, she says to her son, heed my voice. In other words, listen to the voice of your mother and go and bring them, go and bring two kid goats for me to prepare for your father. So he, in that case, in the case of Eve, listening to Eve was the wrong thing to do. And in this case, in the case of Rebecca, Rivka, listening to her voice was the right thing to do. What was one of the things that happened as a result of the sin? that the garments, Adam had holy garments in the Garden of Eden. Now, these, these garments were not necessarily, let's not take it too literally, the garments were not necessarily um, garments in the way that we understand them. They were garments of the soul. They were, um, as we say today, uh, it's, I think, in the, uh, third, the third chapter of Tanya, the third or the fourth chapter of Tanya, we talk about the garments of the soul, thought, speech, and action. So the garments of the soul that Adam was given, the thought, speech, and action, thought, speech, and deed, were holy garments. They were precious garments. <clears throat> but because of the sin, they were taken away from him. Those garments were taken away, and eventually they came into the hands of Nimrod. Nimrod, the great warrior. And Esau killed Nimrod and stole those garments. 
And what happened to the garments? They were in Esau's possession, but he was very nervous about leaving them in his house, in his own house, because of two reasons. One, he was very rushy, he explains. One of the, comment, the classic commentaries explains, he was very worried that the, um, his wives would take those garments and sell them. He had several wives and he was worried that they would, uh, uh, they would get rid of the guy, <coughs> excuse me, they would, um, they would um, sell, his, sell his garments or steal them and uh, whatever. He didn't know what would happen to them. But that's what he was worried about. That's one explanation. The other explanation is that since he only wore them, he only wore these garments, which were originally the garments of Adam, he only, but they had become much coarser. Now they were no, no longer just thought, speech, and action. Now they were actual garments. These garments, these precious garments, he only wore to serve his father. When he went out to the field, he didn't wear those garments. He, when he came back, he put those garments on and he went in to, uh, to, uh, to his father. But so did Jacob when he went in. He wore the garments of that, 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 uh, that Esau was keeping in his mother's house because he didn't want to keep them in his own house. So, as we said, Adam lost the precious garments he'd been given because of his sin, and they eventually came to the hands of Nimrod and then Esau, and Esau didn't keep them in his house, he gave them to his mother to keep. Rebekah took her oldest son's special garments, these garments that he had stolen from Nimrod after he killed him, that she had with her in the house, and she clothed Jacob in them. So when Jacob went in, he went in in these garments that were garments from the Garden of Eden. They were originally Adam's although they had now become more, um, as I said before, more, uh, less refined and more uh, magushan. What's the word, magushan? More material. Okay. All right. Uh, let's go a little bit further. <coughs> um, Eve, she perceived that the tree was good for eating and that it was a delight to the eyes. In other words... <coughs> She was attracted by the external appearance of these things. And, um, and nevertheless, they were, at that time, they were still in the Garden of Eden. Well, they were in the Garden of Eden. And when Jacob goes in to his father, to Isaac, Isaac says, see the fragrance of my son is like the fragrance of a field that God has blessed. What is the field that God blessed? That's the Garden of Eden says uh, the Arizal, says Rabbi Yitzhak Luria. The field that God blessed, that's the Garden of Eden. She looked at the fruit, she looked at the, 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 what they could enjoy, what they could delight in, the fruit, and he understood something much more ethereal, the fragrance. fragrance a fragrance of something is much more ethereal, it's much more spiritual. It's not the uh, delight of the palate, but it's a more refined delight. It's the delight of, they say that uh, the sages explain that it's the soul that delights in a beautiful scent. In any event, so Jacob goes into uh, his father and his father thinks at first that it's Esau. He touches him, he feels his arms, he realizes uh, because Jacob had uh, goat skins on his arms to deceive his father, so to speak. Um, that this was uh, Jacob, and he says the voice is the voice of Jacob, and uh, but the, but the the arms, the hands are the hands of Esau, and the arms, in other words, the arms of Esau, and then he blesses him, and those blessings remained, and that was ultimately the tikkun. That was the tikkun of uh, of Chava, of Eve, of the of what she had done wrong was all rectified by Rivka, by Rebecca. She was the one that rectified, that rectified Eve. She did the opposite of all of Eve's actions on the positive side of things. <coughs> um, the passing down of the garments, was this a passing down of the curse or the light and the promise of the blessing? Uh, the passing down of the garments um, from who to who? Um, it was the remnant of the Garden of Eden that was in the garments. Um, so I suppose that Esau kept them, but he only kept them for one thing, or he only used them rather for one thing, and that was to serve his father. 
he had tremendous uh, respect for his father, tremendous uh, honor. He showed him tremendous honor. Um, but I'm not sure what you mean outside of that. Um, Esau's soul is Esau's soul from the world of Tohu. Yes. Uh, hence, those things are important in this world were mundane uh, to him. Right, it's Sarah. I'm not sure what your next comment is because I can't see it yet. Um, Sarah did not manage to uh, rectify the. Oh, I see. Sarah was an error. Yeah. Okay, so that is the basic uh, setup that Rebecca, Rivka, was the one who rectified Eve. <coughs> Actually, the word Rivka itself is an interesting word. It actually means, the word Rivka actually means, uh, it, it actually refers to a yoke, like the yoke uh, that they put on oxen, the oxen to draw the plow. It's actually a yoke. Generally, it's used, the term is used for a yoke which spans a number of oxen together, making them, you know, when they pull a plow or they pull a very heavy cart or wagon or whatever it was, so the oxen are all pulling together and they make this like a wooden thing that they put over several oxen. In other words, they unite, the, this, this thing unites the oxen together. And that's to a certain extent what, what Rebecca, what her name like signifies. It means the idea of unifying disparate forces, unifying different um, um, aspects and bringing them together as one so that they're all pulling in the same direction. And that's in fact what she did here. Um, had Esau gotten the blessings, they would have destroyed him. They wouldn't have been a blessing for him. They would have been a curse for him because he was not, he was not the right person um, to, for this particular mission. It would have destroyed him. And uh, that's why he was never part of the covenant and um, rightly so. <coughs> or as it was right for Jacob, even though it meant that he had to give up a lot in order to take his covenant, but it was the right thing. And therefore he did it. Okay. So Rivka Ekta rectified Chava, the Tzara rectified for sin, just a little confused. Um, Sarah together, as we, as we spoke about last week, uh, they, 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 they both, Adam and, uh, sorry, Abraham and Sarah together rectified Adam and um, uh, rectified Adam. It was primarily Rivka that rectified Chava, that rectified Eve. Yeah. Do each of the five senses correspond to a level of consciousness? Generally, yes, they do. <clears throat> There's a Zohar that explains this, and the Zohar says, uh, actually, Tikkun Zohar, the Zohar says, actually, in a number of places <clears throat> in the Zohar, that the Zohar, Zohar explains that the concept of sight is associated with Chokhmah, which is the second level of the soul. The highest level of the soul is Keter, which is Yechida, and then the second level of the soul, Chochmah, and that has to do with eyesight. Shmia, hearing, has to do with Bina, and the level of the soul that's called Neshama, the third level down. And uh, Keter is associated with Rayach, with the sense of smell, with this, because it's very ethereal. Interestingly enough, that's why people, um, perhaps that's why people lose their um, sense of smell when they get corona. Or some people do. I didn't actually, but, um, but some people do. <clears throat> they lose their sense of smell because that's the most ethereal sense that we have, uh, smell and taste. Um, yeah. The sense of touch, obviously, is associated with the lowest level of uh, of of uh, called nefesh of the soul, called or consciousness, called uh, nefesh. That's the lowest level. Uh, what do we miss out over here? Um, taste and smell in uh, in in the Hebrew, um, in in Jewish thought, are actually from the same from the same keter. Um, bina, yeah, bina represents neshama, the level of neshama. Yeah, five apertures of Adam Kahneman, yeah. <coughs> okay, the, con the concept of garments, the concept of garments um, could be understood obviously literally, 
but the concept of garments could also un be understood as the garments of the garments of the soul in other words the way the soul expresses itself the soul expresses itself through three faculties thought speech and action and these are called the garments of the soul in tanya the fourth chapter of the work uh, famous work tanya uh, very well worth uh, learning the first uh, at least the first 12 chapters but um, it's in english translation if you want uh, you go to chabad.org and type in tanya t-a-n-y-a -A, tanya and uh, you'll be able to find several renditions several translations plus explanations and so on and so forth okay um ruach and smell uh yeah no not ruach and smell no ruach ruach and um, smell and taste are understood to be the same, the same faculty. They're not the five faculties, not of the five faculties. Um, I mean, they are, but they're one. They're one of the five faculties. They, 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 they're together. Taste and smell are, are, uh, are, are the, so basically the same faculty and correspond to Keter. Um, <coughs> then there's, um, there's also one of the faculties, which is not counted in um, in Western uh, thought, is the faculty of speech. That has to do with ruach. The faculty of speech is ruach, and then the faculty of touch is nefesh. Yeah, um, that's also in the Zohar. The Zohar says it explicitly. Uh, what does the lesson of Jacob and Esau teach us with respect to their suffering? Uh, well, Esau didn't suffer much. He had a good life. <laughs> but Jacob suffered plenty. Um, the suffering of Jacob was... Um, he, took it, he took it upon himself uh, to a certain extent in order to be able to rectify what needs to be rectified. You can't rectify anything without, uh, without effort, and effort uh, you know, often requires some suffering. Uh, Esau did not suffer. He didn't. He had a good life. When did he suffer? Why did he suffer? He didn't suffer anything. He didn't have uh, nothing that we learn about in the Torah. That he. Uh, what did he suffer? Nothing. He had a great life. He was wealthy. He was happy. He had as many wives as he wanted. Uh, he seemed to get away with it all. You know. Yep. Um, yeah, in the days of Mashiach will understand Esau, yeah, could be, but it'll be a rectified Esau, it'll be the world of Tohu, which is included within, subsumed, subsumed within Tikkun, it's the rectified world of Tohu. Uh, <laughs> Martin, <laughs> how could he suffer with all those wives? <laughs> That's great. Uh, how could he not suffer with all those wives? All right. Good one. <laughs> um, he didn't value it anyway, Terry. He didn't value spirituality. So the fact that he lost it did not, uh, <laughs> did not um, bother him. Yes, it should have bothered him, if that's what you're saying. Yes, it should have. But he, was, uh, he happily went along with it. He didn't care. <clears throat> Good laugh, yeah. Right. Okay, folks, I think that's, um, I was gonna make some wife jokes, but <laughs> I don't think it would be appropriate. <laughs> okay, all right, folks, if that's all, then we'll end it here. And um, have a great, there was measure, measure for measure. Yeah, to a certain extent, there was measure for measure. He lost his sensitive, sensitivity to spirituality, I suppose you could say that, was measure for measure. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, that's correct, uh, Elishama, yeah. Okay, all the best. Good night, folks, and see you next week, hopefully. <laughs>